This is Studio 809. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Outdoors Hiking Bob podcast. I am your host, Hiking Bob Falcone. And you can find me and my social media and my websites and all that kind of good stuff at hikingbob.com. And with me today is my co-host, Kevin Wild Westendorf. Hey, everyone. Kevin Wild Westendorf here. And you can find all my stuff on my website, which is wildwestendorf.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Wild Westendorf. Perfect. And also, we would appreciate if you guys uh, listening out there like this podcast, want to support it, you can do that at patreon.com. So it's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash hiking bob. And you can be a supporter and a patron of this podcast and get rewarded depending on your level of um, uh, support. There's different uh, levels of rewards that you can get and if there's a reward there that there's a level there but you're not that's not kind of the reward you want let me know and i'll try to customize something equivalent for you so i um, cool. greatly appreciate that yep and i'm gonna do one more shameless plug here but the holiday buying season is coming up and my photography website might be a great place for you to find some uh, photography type Gift. So check out that. Uh, the link to that is also on my website at hikingbob.com. Kevin, last week you talked about your hike to the Skagway power plant. Yep. And it's one I somehow living here for a, as long as I have still haven't done, which I'm kind of ashamed to admit, but somehow I've not been <laughs> able to do that. So two things I noticed with that. One of which was there's different ways of, play, of spelling Skagway. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And I went with one way and some goes that you know, I can't find any consensus. So I'm not going to say mine's wrong. But I'm not necessarily convinced that it's right either. But I'm sticking with what I have because there are many, many references to the way I spelled it on the uh, on the podcast show notes and and in my uh, Facebook post and you know and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But there are a couple ways to spell. It. I can't find any specific way that one's right or wrong or anything like that. So the other thing was I ran into some friends of ours, so some listeners to the podcast, and was chastised nicely, I will say, Ooh. because. <laughs> We didn't mention, you didn't mention, the uh, tremendous fishing opportunities that are available along the Beaver Creek going down to the reservoir. Now, in our defense, you or I are not fishing, you know, anglers, yeah. so we don't know that. But their point was that it is one of the one of the finest places to go fishing. Which is cool to, in this region. to know, yeah. Yeah, wonderful to know. I did not know. And again, that's not my bag. It's not necessarily yours. But we do try to you know, support all the outdoor recreation here. So if you're a angler and you like to go fishing, you don't even have to go all the way down to the, to the power plant. But the, apparently the Beaver Creek in that area and along the trail you were on taking you down to the power plant, apparently some tremendous fishing. But it would make, make sense along the, the Beaver Creek area because I can't remember if I mentioned this last week, but um, there are several beaver dams, which hence the name of the creek, um, mm -hmm. that were huge. And so there's huge bodies of water that are very still along the creek, which I, I imagine would, would be a great home for, for fish. Yeah, trout probably is what I'm guessing is, is up there, some kind of variety of trout. Again, what I know about fish is what I order at, uh, at Bonefish <laughs> or what I buy at the store. So I'm not really an angler. But, you know, hey, that's good to know, too, that if you're, if you're an angler or if you're somebody who likes to combine the two, you want to go for a hike and along the way, you know, do a little fishing. This this hike to the Skagway power plant is probably a really good one for people to do. It's probably a really good good hike for people to do. Um, one of the things that we are fortunate enough to have is some really great listeners, yeah, and followers sure. on this podcast. And and occasionally, you know, I'll get an email asking a question about a trail. You get them too, or I'll get a DM on one of the social media accounts, you know, hey, hey, Bob, what about this? Or how do I get to this place or anything like that? Happy to answer all your questions. Um, you know, it, it, I would rather you ask a question and get a good answer than not ask a question and be unsure if you go out there and maybe get yourself into a pickle or maybe something's not what you expected and you'd be disappointed or something like that. So we get a couple of questions like that, and, and it's great to get those, and I'm happy to answer anything I can. If I don't, I'll find the answer, or I'll direct you to somebody that does. Yep. And occasionally we get some ideas for podcast topics. Which is great. I, I, I love those. I love those, too, because Kevin, Kevin can tell you that sometimes I send him an email that goes, hey, we've got to record a podcast. 
Uh, I don't have many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and we kind of brainstorm, and I hope that even those podcasts come out pretty good and you all like those. But we had somebody who emailed me with a, a, a number of topics, and we're not going to get to all of these today because some of them I'm going to have to kind of I'm going to need, I'm going to want to get some experts to help us with some of these. So I'm going oh, yeah. to do some research and maybe get somebody on as a guest who could discuss some of these. So there's a couple of questions I had here that we're going to talk about. So we'll try to address a few of these. And Kevin, you and I can chime in on these. One of these was directed at me. It, well, both of us actually. And they said they liked hearing uh, both of us describe our, our experiences while hiking out of Colorado. I mean, you know, you and I do 99% of our hiking here yeah but then i also go down well for me probably closer to 90 percent because i spend a couple months in arizona so i do a lot of hiking in the desert you travel to different places you know we both do some hiking out of there so the question was what do you miss about colorado trails when you're away so um so let's answer that one now i'm about ready when you're listening to this podcast i may be on a plane heading back east um for a family event I may or may not get a chance. I'm going to be there for a very brief period of time. I hope to get in at least a little bit of hiking while I'm there. Definitely some fall colors, leaf peeping, which is a whole lot different there. Oh, I bet. But I was just there. I was just back east in New Jersey back in June. Did a lot of hiking there. I do a lot in Arizona, as you know. And when I go on these various trips I go to with National Geographic, sometimes a little bit of hiking there. Um, so what? I'll let you answer this one first. What do you miss about Colorado trails when you're away, Kevin? So most of my hiking experience outside of Colorado has, has been in the west to southwest. I would say the thing I miss the most are trees. And obviously there's trees in Arizona and Utah, New Mexico, but just I just end up in areas that are very desert-like with, with the total lack of trees, which is fine for the most part. But it's, it's nice getting that break from the summer heat and finding a nice tree to sit up against, to have, have a snack, to have that shade. Because when you want to stop for a moment in the desert... For a snack or something like that, you still have that sun just beating down on you, or you ch you try to find that one sliver of shade. So yeah, I would say definitely the trees. But when I've hiked in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and Hot Springs National Park, and the one hike I did in Alabama, plus I've hiked in Iowa too. With those, I would say I missed the grand vistas. Um, you get it's a different kind of pretty out there. It's gorgeous greenery is lush it's, it's very very green where it makes colorado look very brown so it, it's beautiful it just the views are different and and you you don't quite get the sense of smallness that views out here give you when when you turn a corner and bam there's a, a 14er right there and you see these like huge peaks surrounding you so i, I would say i missed that but it's not to slam hiking in the south or the east um but it's more it, it's just different yeah, that's actually that's actually a really good answer. I, I'm I'm trying to think of what I miss when I'm away, you know, when I'm hiking somewhere else. And I'm so used to hiking in the desert that I don't know that I miss anything except I'm really aware of the vast differences there is between hiking here and then going down to the desert in Arizona, which is where I go to most often when I'm not here or I'm in Utah, which is kind of the same environment. So I, I'm always reminded of the big differences there are, you know, hiking at 1,100 feet as opposed to, you know, starting here at 6,300 feet and just going up from here. So I'm aware of those. So the vistas, I guess, you know, you can mention. But in the desert where there's no trees, you get those big, wide, expansive views. Yeah. They're just different. They're just more flat. You know, there's a lot of mountains that ring, you know, the the desert relatively they're very tall but they're not nearly as tall as what we have here yeah what i miss is some of the resources i'm used to using here the biggest one being cotrex oh um, yeah big is, time big time we're one of the i think one of the only states i think oregon has something similar that has a statewide database that's assembled in one spot of maps and the and the app and website to go with it i miss that so then you're relying on a lot of other sources and as we've talked about that can get a little dicey. And of course, I always tell people never rely completely on one source. Always oh, yeah. check your stuff. But, you know, as we know, and as people listen know, I'm a pretty firm believer in Cotrex because there's at least everything on there is sanctioned and, and uh, vetted. 
some stuff may be out of date because agencies may take a while to submit updates and stuff like that, but and nothing's perfect. But I kind of miss that resource. I kind of miss like our friends at tra- at Pocket Pals and their really good local, local oh, yeah. trail maps that are just wonderful. And, and as a matter of fact, I, um, I saw the folks there at an event a couple of weeks ago and just had a really long talk with them, just uh, appreciate how much work they put in to produce it. So I'm a, I kind of miss those kind of things too. But to me, they're just different. I guess when I go back east, which I don't do very often, I mean, this is going to be odd that I'm going twice in one year. Usually I just go every several years. Uh, I go back into the East Coast. What I miss, I guess it's just going to kind of sound weird. What I miss when I go there is that there, I miss that we don't have any bugs here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't have humidity. We don't have, I, so I miss the lack of humidity. I miss the lack of biting, stinging, annoying bugs that fly around. I mean, we have them here, obviously, but not nearly to the extent that we have them oh, yeah. back on the coast. And, and I actually kind of like that it's relatively dry here and in the desert. So I guess you can say I kind of miss all the things that makes it nice to live in and recreate here. You know, I, I think that that's, I think it's kind of cool. So if I am going back east and I if I get a chance to do a hike, like I said, I'm going back just for a few days and it's a family event. Um, I'll make sure to just let people know what I think of that, you know, what, and I'll pay a little bit more attention to what I miss. I did do quite a bit of hiking when I was back in June, and I think I wrote, a, I at least did some Facebook posts. I don't think I wrote a column about it, because obviously nobody's going to go back to those remote places in uh, southern New Jersey just to go hiking, <laughs> <laughs> unless you happen to be there. But I did mention in the in the Facebook post how they were a little different, and, you know, at the time I went back there right after a forest fire, and some of the trails oh, that's have right. been burned and a lot of places I wanted to go hiking were closed still because they're still working on those fires. So that I guess that's I guess it's one of the answers, I guess. And to kind of answer it differently a little bit is what I do enjoy when I'm hiking, especially in the south and the east um, and the Midwest, is, is how, it's how much softer the soil is. Because here, it, the ground's fine, but Pikes Peak Granite just eats up your shoes. It's much more i would say it's, it's harder on your knees where at least you know it's dirt it's rocks um where in the south and east and such uh it, it's like soft soil and it's much nicer to hike on you know i'm glad you mentioned that the same thing here in the here in the pikes peak region we have pikes peak granite and this is like the only place in the world and in, in missouri for some reason there's a some like little vein granite. yeah that, a little vein of it that pops up there uh, and when you're down in the desert Everybody thinks desert sand and stuff like that. Mostly the desert is very hard soil. And when you hike down there, the other part is when in the with no ground cover, there's no shade. And not only is there no shade, but the 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 ground acts like a reflector. Yeah, and yeah. The, and we've talked about this before, I think, that the heat just reflects right back in your face. It feels like an oven. And 85 degrees hiking there is a lot different than 85 degrees hiking there. So what I do appreciate back there, and you mentioned it, was how soft the earth is. Yeah. Uh, when I went back there in June, I brought a pair of my lightest weight hiking boots, and it was like walking on a on a on a trail oh of, of, of of feathers. You know, it was like walking on a trail of down. It was so soft. It's like my feet don't hurt at all, and I don't feel like every little rock or anything like that. So I guess I miss that, but not in a, I, I don't miss that like, oh, man, I really miss hiking on that. It's like, boy, that's really nice to walk on this <laughs> on this softer surface. So I guess it's something kind of missing in a reverse way. Like, I, yeah, I miss it because it's, it's so much better out there, if that makes any sense. Let's see. They asked a question about footwear. There's another question we had here. Do you take your shoes off when crossing creeks, such as, and, and this is, was partially in response to the, the couple of columns I've done about hiking around Dome Rock. State wildlife areas, you do that big loop. There's a number of creek crossings. Yep. And they said if the water gets in the top of their boots, do the stocks stay wet for long? What will hiking miles and and wet socks cause blistered heels? So I'll answer these questions kind of in order. If it looks like it's going to be, if it's wide and it's fairly deep, of course you're going to have to gauge that. Yeah, I'll take my boots off and walk across barefoot. Although I kind of learned my lesson this year down in the south central part of the state. Even that wasn't the greatest idea. I will take my my boots off or something like that. If I think I can rock hop it or I might just dip a a foot in, um, I'll wear my boots. I always buy waterproof Gore-Tex or some similar type lined boots. I always wear wool socks. The the, the thickness just depends on the season, obviously. 
I always wear wool socks. So I have found that if I get my foot wet, typically it's briefly, I'll step on a rock that's not as solid as I thought and my, I'll dip my foot. Typically my feet don't stay wet for very long. Now, Gore-Tex lining in your boots wears out after a while, and eventually that doesn't dry out as well when your boots get older. One of the things I learned when I was hiking down in the area around the southern part of the state, uh, near Antonito and Chama, New Mexico, was one of the creeks I crossed was very rocky, which was very hard on the feet, trying to stay stable, and it kind of hurt your bare feet, but it was too deep to walk across in in my boots, and then the next two I had to go through were very muddy. But for those, I took my boots off. The problem was in the little space in between, it was very sharp rocks yep. to walk on. So that, it was kind of difficult. What I've what I've done is I have a pair of um, I don't know what kind of what you what you call these shoes. I got them on my tr- with my trips with National Geographic because sometimes when you do the zodiac landings, you do what they call a wet landing. Which means you're landing, you have to walk in water a little ways. Oh, okay. So they're kind of like a, um, they're made by, a number of different companies make them. But they have like a sole on them that's like a, like a hiking boots, boot sole, but they're like a sandal. Um, they stay on pretty securely because if you get in mud, you don't want these things to get sucked off your feet. Um, they're very lightweight, not terribly expensive. So you, you can walk in those and your feet just, everything just drains off. Um, and what I'll do in that is I'll tie my boots together and throw them over my shoulder with the socks stuffed in them, and I carry, I carry a number of bandanas with me in my, in my backpack. And what I'll do is, I when I get done doing this, I'll take those boot those off because they're definitely not something you want to hike a long distance in. Yeah, dry out my feet, put on the socks, and then, um, and then go my merry way. And I'll just you know clip these onto my pack, and they'll be you know they dry almost instantly. I bought a pair of those for when I'm going on a hike when I think there's going to be water. The last hike I did around Dome Rock. There's that one creek that's way back around Dome Rock itself. Yep. I know exactly which, you know, which one, too. And getting across that is difficult. It is wide. And when I say wide, it's probably 30 feet. And it is, in, and even in the fall, it's it's flowing pretty good, and it's kind of deep. When I say deep, it's, uh, you know, knee deep, I think, in some places. I managed to find a spot where I could jump across it, one place where it got kind of narrow. But then I had to scramble to find a way back to the trail. Oh, yeah. Um, the other creek crossings there in, in the fall were just easy to just hop across so there were enough rocks in place that you can just, somebody had to be a little careful. Definitely hiking poles helped um, and just bup, 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 you can get across those pretty easily. But in the spring, in the summer when that trail opens up, if there's been a lot of rain yep. and a lot of um, even then some lingering snow melt, they can all be pretty difficult to get across, which is why I usually tell people do that do that hike in the fall, a little earlier than I did. And you can also catch, you know, you also be treated to some nice fall colors views there. So I guess it just depends, but a combination of waterproof boots or at least boots that breathe and, you know, let the water kind of come out of them and wool socks because wool, you know, wicks water away from you. You can also use polypropylene socks also work pretty well. I like wool because I also like the cushioning quality of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that is the best way to handle that kind of stuff. And pretty much it's kind of the same thing for winter. Um, you know, we get an inch or two of snow. Do you need really heavy winter boots? Nah, you probably just need some good waterproof hiking boots. And our snow here is so dry anyway. So that's what, it, as far as it causing blisters, I have been somehow lucky that I almost never get blisters. I, I can think on one hand, I don't know why I've been so lucky. Maybe because I'm very picky about the, the fit of my boots. And if I buy a pair I've never bought before, you know, a brand or a model, I'll wear them a lot before I take them. And if I feel like they're hot in one spot or they're loose, I'll just return them. Yeah. And get something else. I won't wear them. Um, I guess that hiking in wet socks can be a problem. But again, if you go back to wearing, you know, boots that are Gore-Tex, so they kind of let the moisture out and, um, you know, don't don't get in. Well, if you don't get in over your over the top of the boot, then you're probably not going to get water inside. Um, if they're real, if they're not, a, you know, very old, they're going to do a good job with a little bit of water, keeping it out. Now, obviously if you're going to stand in a Creek, yeah. regardless of what you got, your foot, your foot's going to get, you're going to get wet anyway. Typically it's not going to be an issue, but yeah, if they, if they get wet and your and your foot stays wet, you're probably on your way to getting some blisters. So that's where definitely, if you do get your feet wet, I would definitely recommend, and it doesn't hurt to carry like an extra pair of socks. Definitely stop, and if you have a bandana or a small 
microfiber towel with you to dry off your feet, maybe wring out your socks, and then get your footwear back on, and that will probably help reduce that. I would try not to walk a long distance if your foot, like, really soaked. I would try to, you know, take off your shoes and socks and dry your feet off and, um, you know, before you um, proceeded any further, especially with creek water and you don't know what stuff is in there, then you get a blister Mm -hmm. that opens up on, that might open up on you and you get that water in there. Yeah, you might be setting yourself up for a little bit of an issue. And I've I've definitely learned the lesson the hard way about trying to cross the creek barefoot. If it's fairly shallow and stuff, like like fine, but I did try and cross a creek. That was a hike we had done in 2017 over um, Memorial Day weekend. So of course it's a lot of spring runoff, fresh snow melt. And this this creek was very, very wide and the water was just rushing. And so I att- attempted to cross it barefoot. I made it to the other side. And of course the water was super, super, super cold. So my, my feet got numb immediately. And I put on my socks and shoes after I crossed it and got about a mile down and, re- and realized I had broken my toe because oh, no. I jammed it on a rock or something. Ooh. And this was a backpacking trip. So I still had a day and a half left of hiking. Um, the way my toe looked after I got back home after that was not pretty. How much pain were you in for the rest of that trip? I think the adrenaline and the cold water made it like better mm-hmm. but by the time I, I was getting close to the end of the hike the next day that's when it was it was just like coursing through my leg and and my toe was like black i i, I thought i had damaged it like forever Ugh. so from now on i do if, if i know if, I, if if i'm gonna cross cross the creek a lot i i do bring uh the waterproof sandals they're really lightweight just rubber um they're they're not meant like the shoes that you you've got they're they're not meant to be hiked in but they're great for if you got to cross the creek real quick and it'll protect your feet too because i i i had a friend slice open her her foot one time Ooh. on a sharp rock which then like it was a pretty big cut so she had to cut her hike sh- short and all that and get back because she, she only had so much in her first aid kit too so it's like okay it's best to just turn back i think she got stitches actually but ooh. Yeah, and, and it's just, it was just a sharp rock or an optic or something in, in the creek. So, yeah, I think it's very, very important to, to have some kind of protection unless if the creek is really shallow and it's it's not that wide and you, you can see where where you are stepping, then sure. But yeah. when it's a roaring creek and you're trying to cross as fast as possible and, you, and with the roaring creek, you can't always see where, where you are stepping to. Right, right. The, the last one I did, the one down near Chama where I crossed the creek, and I went there a couple times because it's just a beautiful spot. You think that those big, round river rocks would be easy to walk across. They're not. Oh, they're very, very slick sometimes. Yeah, and the mud was actually easier to get through, but of course, that's mud sucking on your feet, and it just, you know, definitely don't want to wear anything loose on that because you're just going to just, you're going to get mud and everything, and they'll, oh, they'll pull your boots off. Kevin, another question we had here, there was a question about the Section 16 trail. Oh, yeah. Um, on the south west part of town and the closure that's been in effect since early summer when there was a rock slide there what is the status of that the status of that is it's still closed the forest service is and i'm not dig- dinging on anybody at the local office here but it is a part of a federal bureaucracy and the wheels turn very slowly there yeah they want to do an evaluation of it they want to see how safe it is once they get a determination of how safe it is, then they're going to go in there. And then, and all this stuff requires they have to get a contract with somebody to go up and do this. Then they have to get somebody else to go up there and actually do the repairs on the trail. So the answer to that is the trail is still closed. The problem that we have, get, we're getting in the winter, not that that gets a lot of snow there, but things kind of slow down. I don't foresee that, and hopefully I'm wrong. I'd like to be wrong on this. I don't foresee that opening before next spring. Which is such a bummer because it's one of my favorite trails too. Oh yeah, Cole likes going up there with me and stuff, and it's a nice loop to do. And you know, people have their opinions on which way to go. I like going clockwise. Some people like going counterclockwise. But yeah, I I would love to be wrong and tell you it's not going to open until spring. I would love it if, it, and I want to be wrong in that that it happens sooner. I certainly don't want to be wrong and it happens later than that. But I think it's still going to be a while before that opens up. But it is still closed. Do I know that people are going up there? Yeah, probably are. I do want to say that you're probably if if you drive by and you see a lot of cars at the trailhead, the the um, 
trail is not closed at the trailhead. It's closed for further up the trail, right. where um, it's the last trail junction that connects you to White Acre Open Space and Red Rock Canyon. Um, so that like it's close to that point. Right. I thought it was actually open up to the open up to the Waterfall Trail. I think that's the junction I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. It's, okay, the Waterfall Trail and the Indiman Trail. So yeah, just before that's the last junction before it goes up the hill. There are people in the recreation community who think that the trail should be reopened pending repairs with adequate signage, warning people, and uh, advising that, people to be yeah. careful. And again, it's the, you know, and the worst part is this, this section of the trail is this tiny little piece that's actually on Forest Service land. Yeah. Everything on either mm-hmm. side of it is on, this, it's on city property. Um, the federal government, unfortunately, doesn't really work that way. So unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, it has been suggested to the Forest Service, hey, why don't you just do this? And my understanding is that they were not uh, amenable to that. And plus, I think a lot of people don't understand that a like it, it, it was a literal landslide. So a lot of that quote unquote new ground up there could be very unstable. Right. And you get someone who, even if they're experienced, they they go up there and they think they've they've they found a good route to get to the other side of the trail that's not damaged um might hit a part and the ground will will slide even more like so it, it's a huge safety issue and that may happen though once somebody goes up there and evaluates it and decides yeah you know the the danger is probably passed that may happen yeah where they'll just say well we're you know you're not gonna have a bridge you have to figure out your way across here but you know so maybe they're just waiting on the evaluation of it. I'll try to get more information from the Forest Service on this, but my understanding is it's just taking the federal wheels of bureaucracy are slow, rusty, and and <laughs> and, and not greased. So sometimes it takes a while. Again, it's not a dig on the local the local ranger district. They are part of that bureaucracy, and they some of these things get above their heads, and they just have to wait for the wheels to turn. So that's the that's the situation with the section 16 trail um kevin there was one other question here and i mentioned this kind of obliquely in my last column i wrote about hiking in dome rock because as you and i know that big loop you can only do from the middle of july to the the beginning of the first of the last day of november basically yeah you have a very tiny window to do some of those trails in there and some of those trails are gorgeous and i wrote about um, doing the War Party Trail, the War Party Overlook, that you and I tried to find once and couldn't find yeah. it. <laughs> I finally found it. It is not marked, and I posted coordinates of it. But one of the things I wrote about in there, when you hike the Willow Creek Trail, which takes you up, 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 until you get to where you can get to the other trails, um, the, the, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife has really cleared out a lot of the aspens in there. Oh, okay. Um, and also on the rest of the Willow Creek Trail where it kind of loops back around to the Dome Rock Trail. That is, it's easy to think that that might be for fire mitigation, but it's not. It's actually for wildlife. Apparently, and I, and I have to go back and look it up, and I, and I can feature this in a column coming up. I, somebody had seen this months and months ago, and I got the answer from it from CPW, and then I never did publish it. But what it, what they're doing there is... They're clearing out those trees to actually in- improve the habitat for wildlife in that area. So if you go up there and you, you hike up the Willow Creek Trail, you'll see that there's just acres of the aspens that have been um, chopped down. But it is apparently some kind of wildlife habitat improvement project that CPW is working with. I'll get more information on that and, and feature it in a column and maybe talk about it a little bit more on the podcast, too. So I think those are the questions. Oh, one other question here, Kevin, and I don't know if you have an answer to this. Um, they want The uh, writer wanted to know if we have any recommendations for books about experiences hiking, climbing mountains, and camping. So the, the one and only one that immediately comes to mind is a book called A Walk in the Woods. Ba- basically a, a, a basic history of the Appalachian Trail. And is that the, the Bill Bryson book? Yeah. Yep, yes. Yep. It's that one. Yep. Okay. Um, it's it's been several years, so my memory's a little spotty, but I I just remember it. It focuses on the last stretch of the trail in Maine, and the author and his friend just de- detail their experiences, and I just found it very funny, very lighthearted, inform informative. It's very informal um storytelling of, about the trail. Uh, it, it wasn't super like technical or with a ton of jargon and such but now i want to dig that book up 
and read it again because I, I I remember really really enjoying it. But this was probably back in 2014 or 15 when I last read it. For anybody who's not familiar with Bill Bryson, he's a he's a writer writes about a lot of different things. He's, he's hysterically funny. Yeah, he wrote about he, another one. He wrote about a similar thing. He's called in the sunburned country and is about trekking across Australia. Oh, okay. Um, I was just say not a fan. <laughs> he was not a fan. <laughs> when he got done. <laughs> But it, um, the book you're talking about is really good. It's funny. It ended up being a movie with Robert Redford playing Bill Bryson, and, and Bill Bryson should send Robert Redford a, a big thank you because it did not look like Robert Redford at all. <laughs> It'd be like me having, yeah, who's going to play you in a movie? Well, I'd like to be George Clooney, but yeah. <laughs> um, you know, George Clooney doesn't look anything. I don't look anything like George Clooney. That is a good book. Um, that is a fun book to read. And a lot of what he talks about in there is the logistics of it. Now, Bill Bryce is, I don't want to say he's a serious writer, but his writing is not serious. A lot of it's very comical. It's very funny. Yeah. The story is hysterical that he tells there. So that is a very good choice to read about that. The other one I would write about would be the one that ended up also being a movie with Reese Witherspoon, which is Wild, which is the book by Cheryl Stray. Oh, yeah. Really good book. And again, what's good about that was the logistics. And there's one scene in the movie near the beginning where she has her backpack so full of stuff that she literally yep. cannot lift it up to put it on her back. And how at one of the first places she stops and she runs into a more experienced hiker, the first thing they do is throw out half the stuff that she has in her back. Yeah. Uh, you learn a lot about, you know, what it takes to, you know, what you need for a really long, for a through hike like that. I think it's a really good book. And uh, I, I haven't besides read just the being book, a great but story. I've, I've seen the movie. It's a fantastic movie too. Yep. Yeah, that's a good one. A couple of the books I, I like, Into the Wild. Oh, good choice. With John Krakauer, which is about the guy who, who went up into, into Alaska trying to find himself and, you know, live with the bears and stuff like that. The story does not end well, but it's a really good story. If you want to learn, and, I, and again, I'm not disparaging anybody here. If you want to learn about a lot of really bad decisions, this book has a lot of really bad decisions made in it. It is a fascinating story. Things just do not necessarily go well but it's a really well story Krakow writes really great stuff so he is a a very good author I would highly recommend reading that book too and there's one other one that he wrote in the thin air personal account of the Mount Everest disaster that is also a really really good book now if you're looking for books about how to there's there's a bazillion books I there's so many. Oh, yeah, it's, it's uh, countless. I can't recommend. It's just impossible for me to recommend any one book. The nice thing about all the books you and I have recommended was they're not they're not fiction at all. These are true life experiences typically told either about somebody who experienced them or by the person who experienced them. So these are the books I would suggest. Into Thin Air, Into the Wild, Wild, and... A Walk in the Woods. A Walk in the Woods. I'm sorry. And I it's looked sh- up the movie, and it's a relatively newer film, too. Yeah. I, yeah. I had no idea yeah. um, that it came out in 2015, and I didn't see anything about it. But Now, this is not super related to outdoor recreation, but you did remind me of a book that I read in 2018 um, that was incredible. It's called The Indifferent Stars Above, and it's it's the whole story of the Donner Party. If you know anything about the story, it's very gruesome in some parts, but it just kind of shows the harsh reality of traveling through through the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas back in the day when, when there weren't a lot of resources. And I would say the early 1900s or late 1800s? It was late 1800s. Late 1800s. And it was a part of the gold rush. And, and when when you had mentioned um, Into the Wild, and it just shows a series of bad choices being made, Um, just... One thing after another with the Donner Party, just a, a, a lot of the leadership, which is very greedy, um, didn't plan things out well. Um, so they got a late start. And it also happens to be that was one of the worst winters on the record, even to this day. Right. Um, so it's just all these factors of bad choices plus bad timing. It's just, yeah, it, it's a fantastic book. It's it's tough to read in certain parts, obviously, but it it just it, it made me think of why it's so important to be be smart w- when you're in the outdoors, whether it's doing a through hike or backpacking, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that answers that question. And if you have any other questions, there's some other questions we have here, but we're getting a little long in the podcast, so I think we're just going to save some of these for later. Like I said, there's a couple here that I want to, you know, I think might be good to bring in some experts. So I think we'll, oh yeah, we might do that. 
and we'll bring in some people to talk about some of these other topics we have here. Really great questions. If you have any questions for us or if you have topic suggestions, please email Kevin or I. If you go to either one of our websites, we have links there where you can message us. Or if you go to our social media, you can send us a message and we'll be happy to look at your suggestions. There have been people who suggested stuff in the past and they email me back. Why didn't you have this person on? Not everybody is comfortable being on a podcast. So, and I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to treat this like 60 minutes from a show up at the door with the, <laughs> with the recorder going. You got to answer my questions here. Um, definitely not the way we operate. But most people that we do approach, the vast majority would love to be on the podcast. So, if you have a suggestion for a guest or a topic for us to cover, we would sure like to hear from you. And welcome those questions and suggestions. Kevin, I think that's what we'll cover there today. You had one more thing you wanted to talk about, I think. And we'll... uh, Yep. Um, so I've talked about this a, a million times on, on the show, but it, as you may know, the Grand Canyon is my favorite place I've, I've, I've ever been. Back in 2018, I did the Rim to Rim to Rim hike, which was almost 50 miles in one day. And ever since then, I've, I've been wanting to get a tattoo of it. So uh, I decided as an early birthday tree to myself i i would get a a, a tattoo of it because I, I finally found an artist i i really liked her style um she goes by matt m-a-d-s so i'm assuming it's like i didn't ask but i'm assuming a short for like like madison or, or or a name like that but she goes by matt and she works out of timeless body art tattoo shop that is downtown on bijou street and she did an incredible job on the tattoo i got if, if you go on my my social media whether it's my personal account or wild westendorf on instagram and facebook um there's a, a photo of it and so if, if you're thinking of getting work done, she was very affordably priced. She did an amazing job on it. She was also very quick with it too, which I'm, I'm thankful for. Yeah, so check her out. And I can say from having seen it both in pictures and now in person, it is to die for. Even if you're not a tattoo person, you will appreciate the artistry in it. It is gorgeous. It really, really looks wonderful. So Thank if, you. You, if you get it yet, yeah, I mean, it's... You could not have asked for a better thing. It is really, really nicely done. But I'm forgetting about the. It, it's been ten ten years since I've, I've I've gotten a tattoo, and I totally forgot about the healing phase where it, it starts itching really <laughs> bad and oh, it's killing me. <laughs> I've been watching Kevin here do everything he can to try not to itch that and, and having a having a miserable time not succeeding <laughs> with that. But he's trying. He's, he's doing a good job. So anyway, it is it is very beautiful, nicely done. And uh, I would I would highly suggest looking up Kevin's social media, and you'll see it on there. It really is pretty. So even if you're not a tattoo person, I think anybody would look at that and really appreciate you know the work that was done there. So great job with that. Thank you. And great job to her for. Oh, she she knocked it out of the park. Absolutely. For those of you who get my newsletter, there will not be a newsletter this week. I I meant to put that in the last newsletter that I won't be doing because I'm going to be away and taking care of some family business. We will have a podcast next week. I think I have a special guest lined up for that one. Cool. Which should be kind of fun. I think with that, Kevin, I think we'll say goodbye. We'll talk to you later. Okay, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Outdoors Hiking Bob podcast. Before you go, did you know you can rate and review our Studio 809 podcasts? That will help us because our egos really need to have thousands and thousands of listeners. But that helps our wonderful sponsors reach more ears, too. And we do love our sponsors. So just go to Studio 809 or any individual 809 podcast in your iTunes or podcast app and click on Ratings and Reviews. Thanks.